and now we can uh, go far east to Hong Kong. Samantha, good afternoon. It's your turn. Good morning, everyone. We are the team from the Division of Periodontology of the Faculty of Dentistry in the University of Hong Kong. Today, our task is to discuss a part of the third step of therapy, specifically maxillary furcations. Treatment of maxillary furcations is a very complex aspect of periodontal therapy. There are varying difficulties that we encounter in almost every situation. Today, we will try to take a look at the management of maxillary buccal class II furcation involvement, the regenerative biomaterials used in the regenerative treatment, as well as the management of interdental maxillary class II and class III furcation involvement as well. In order to answer these questions, the guidelines referenced four main papers to support the recommendations. Honba et al. in 2009, Domish et al. in 2020, Yepsen et al. in 2002, and Yepsen et al. in 2019. So, what do these systematic reviews tell us? In 2009, Honba and colleagues tried to systematically review the survival rate and incidence of complications such as recurrence of periodontitis, periodontal abscesses, combined endodontic periodontic lesions, endodontic complications, caries, and root fractures, infurcation involved multi-rooted teeth following periodontal therapy after at least five years. A total of 22 publications were included, majority under the category of surgical therapy not involving tooth substance, meaning access flaps, open flap debridement, and the like, and surgical resective therapy. In this systematic review, no study compared treatment outcomes between different procedures. Heterogeneity between studies in terms of baseline furcation condition, therapeutic approach, and follow-up protocol precluded meta-analysis. A considerable risk of bias was present owing to the retrospective nature of majority of the studies. The authors conclude that no treatment was clearly and adequately shown to be superior to another in terms of tooth survival. However, they also noted that the various therapeutic approaches yielded good long-term survival rates. Although the survival rates appear to be promising, the ranges are quite wide, and given the heterogeneity of the data, these numbers should be interpreted with caution. Teeth treated with non-surgical furcation therapy showed to be most effective in treating class 1 furcations, but is limited by the incomplete removal of calculus and the inability to change the interradicular anatomy. Access flaps or open flap debridement provide access for professional debridement in the furcation. In tunneling, carry surface to be one of the major complications. Surgical resective therapy presents with major complications such as vertical root fracture and endodontic failures. And finally, guided tissue regeneration and grafting exhibited probing attachment and bone gain in maxillary class II buccal furcations, but this was not consistent with the interproximal sites. With updated evidence for similar topics, the paper by Domish et al. aimed to evaluate the benefit of resective surgical periodontal therapy, such as root amputation or resection, root separation, and tunneling in class II and III furcation involvement in comparison to non-surgical therapy or open flap debridement, with the primary outcome measure of tooth survival. A total of seven studies were included, six of which were related to maxillary furcations. Data in this study were highly heterogeneous regarding follow-up and distribution of furcation involvement. Here, they combined the analysis for maxilla and mandible and also included furcated premolars and third molars. The results show that in terms of survival rate, class II furcations yielded generally better results than class three. Tooth location, whether maxillary or mandibular, first or second molar, could have possibly affected the results. And although the numbers look quite promising, as seen in the flowchart on the right, we feel that the range is quite large. The authors concluded that there is not enough evidence to show the benefits of resective treatment when compared to the non-surgical approach and OFT. The following two papers are more applicable to the regenerative approach of therapy. This study by Yepsen et al. in 2002 aimed to systematically assess the efficacy of guided tissue regeneration in the treatment of periodontal furcation defects in comparison to open flap debridement with the primary outcome being change in horizontal furcation depth assessed at re-entry. In this study, 16 papers were included, but only nine of which are for the maxillary, and even less were specific to the interproximal sites. Heterogeneity surfaced due to the variability in multiple factors that may potentially have affected the outcomes, as well as in the methodology in terms of measurement, surgical technique, and the membrane used. 
Here, the weighted mean difference between groups was analyzed. The authors found that in terms of horizontal frication depth at re-entry, there was a slight but significantly greater gain in the GTR group. But the location of the frication defect was not specified, meaning whether it was in the buccal, mesial, or distal. With regards to vertical assessments, a significantly greater gain in vertical probing attachment level and reduction in vertical probing depth was detected in maxillary class II mesial frications. And a slight but significantly greater gain in these same parameters was also noted in the assessment of the maxillary class II group. However, the location was not specified. A meta-analysis for the outcome of frication closure was not possible due to the sparse and heterogeneous data. But the authors found that the occurrence of frication closure ranged between 0 to 66%, which again is a very wide range. Jepsen and colleagues in 2019 conducted a study with two aims. First, to investigate the clinical performance of regenerative periodontal surgery in comparison to OFD in the treatment of frication defects. And second, to compare different regenerative techniques. With regards to the first aim of the study, in terms of quality of evidence, they only used three randomized controlled trials analyzing specifically the maxillary buccal class suffocations, and only one of which involved a direct comparison of GTR with OFD, which is the study by Santana et al. highlighted in the forest plot on the left. There is an unclear or high risk of bias in the studies, as well as moderate heterogeneity in terms of clinical measurements and methodology used. The authors concluded that in comparison to OFD, regeneration shows an added benefit in terms of frication improvement, assessed in the form of frication conversion or complete closure, as well as in horizontal attachment level. For the second aim, 19 studies were included in the analysis. The following limitations surfaced. The heterogeneity between studies was moderate to high. There was an unclear risk of bias and included not only researcher initiated, but also industry-initiated studies. The authors noted that the network inconsistency was low, making the direct and indirect comparisons more reliable. With regards to patient-reported outcome measures, EMD presented with the least post-operative swelling and pain, but was analyzed in only one study. In this study, the most significant parameter noted was horizontal bone level gain, and bone replacement graph presented with the highest probability for this followed by its combination with GTR using resorbable membranes, then followed by EMD. However, the authors concluded that despite this, there is still no gold standard in regenerative treatment of class II furcations. Having discussed the supporting evidence, the next challenge would be carrying out this insight into our clinical practice. These photos show multiple scenarios of maxillary molar teeth with class II furcation involvement. And although they are all classified as such, they may still vary greatly and does not always indicate the same treatment approach. The recent guidelines shed light onto this issue, and we would like to discuss them along with some factors we identified that may affect our clinical application. So, what are the recommendations and how do we apply them clinically? With regards to the management of residual deep pockets associated with maxillary buccal class II furcation involvement, the of these with periodontal regenerative surgery, using the Jepsen paper in 2019 as supporting literature, which only included randomized controlled trials. However, only three studies were included, which presented with large heterogeneity and an unclear risk of bias, as mentioned earlier. Therefore, the overall recommendation is graded as B. In order to obtain the best result from different treatment approaches, careful case selection is of paramount importance. We will discuss the following aspects, including patient factors, site factors, intraoperative factors, and postoperative care. In general, at the patient level, subjects should be systemically healthy and have a good oral hygiene level. Smoking status of the patient must be considered and is preferably a non-smoker. In line with the grading, we listed some site factors of concern, which we hope future studies will address. Presence of proximal frication involvement greater than or equal to class two, Morphology of the furcation, such as entrance with root anatomy, root trunk concavities, and length. Role of adjacent interproximal bone height. Significance of soft tissue quantity and quality, such as the gingival margin in relation to the fornix, and width of keratinized tissue, as shown in the pictures on the right, and the role of mobility. With regards to intraoperative factors and postoperative care, the effect of antibiotics is still unclear. And in terms of maintenance, its frequency and review protocols highly varied in the studies. We believe that regardless of the treatment modality, 
supportive periodontal care is of utmost importance in trying to prevent progression of periodontal disease. The next guideline is about the choice of regenerative biomaterials for class II buccal furcation involvement. The authors recommend using EMD alone or bone-derived graft with or without resorbable membranes. The committee gave this a grade of A. With the Yepsen paper in 2019 as supporting evidence, that included 19 RCTs, although majority of which are for the mandibular buccal furcations, supplemented by indirect evidence with good network consistency and expert opinion, these materials showed to contribute to the regenerative approach of treatment in different parameters. Some concerns we have with regards to this guideline are that, for EMD, only three studies were included that utilized it alone, and there are still no human histological data available for use in class two furcations at present. However, it was reported to result in less postoperative swelling and pain. For bone graft with or without membranes, there's no analysis between the types of graft used, whether it is autograft, allograft, or xenograft. For GTR, the paper mentioned that there is no significant difference between non-resorbable and resorbable membranes in the parameters assessed. However, of note is that the use of non-resorbable membranes require another re-entry operation. Under this category, a high incidence of complications such as membrane exposure affects the outcome of therapy, which again brings light to the concern regarding soft tissue quantity and quality, as well as location of the defect. There is currently still no consensus on which technique is more superior than the other. Different schools of thought may influence the choice of technique. In our school, we usually only use EMD with or without bone graft in our regenerative procedures. The next guideline is related to the management of maxillary interdental class II furcation involvement. The authors state that in these areas, non-surgical instrumentation, open flap debridement, periodontal regeneration, root separation or root resection may be considered. The committee gave this guideline a grade of O, an open recommendation, given that it is supported by only observational studies with low quality of evidence for non-regenerative approaches, such as the paper by Domish, and by two systematic reviews with low quality of evidence for regenerative treatment, as presented by Hunba and Yepsen et al. Here, the authors express that the, it is still unclear regarding which treatment modality is superior and how predictable each one is. We have listed some factors to take into consideration that may help in our decision making. With regards to non-surgical furcation therapy, as mentioned in the Hunba study, this approach is more effective in class one furcation involvement. The benefit becomes limited in more severe furcation involvement, given the likelihood of incomplete removal of calculus. The effect of non-surgical therapy may also be affected by the morphology of the furcation, its entrance, opening, and location, which affects the accessibility of instrumentation, and the morphology of the root, such as root shape, concavity, and grooves. We believe that the benefits gained from non-surgical furcation therapy may even be reinforced when used in conjunction with other treatment modalities. An intraoperative factor that should also be considered is the use of instruments such as curved tips that permit thorough debridement of the furcation region. For open flap debridement, we believe that this modality would be beneficial in sites where non-surgical instrumentation may have limited accessibility and where resective and regenerative approaches are unfavorable. This treatment option facilitates access for professional debridement of the region and also provides the opportunity to create an architecture of hard and soft tissues that not only attains a shallower probing depth, but also facilitates patients' self-performed oral hygiene. With regards to root resection or separation, on top of the factors that we have mentioned in the previous slides, we believe that there is a need to consider the following. For patient factors, low caries risk and the absence of parafunctional habits such as bruxism, for site factors, the morphology of the roots, its divergence, shape, and incomplete separation, the amount of residual bone support of the remaining roots, the number of and which roots to resect, the endodontic aspect, and the definitive restoration of the roots, whether it will be used as a single crown or bridge abutment, and considering the size of the occlusal table. For periodontal regeneration in maxillary interdental class II regions, on top of the considerations mentioned in the maxillary buccal class II furcations, some side factors of concern to us are the absence of other sites with furcation involvement greater than or equal to class II in the same tooth, the morphology of the furcation such as entrance width, root anatomy, root trunk concavities and length, which affects the accessibility of the furcation, 
and the ability to thoroughly debride it. Here, we would like to especially highlight the role of the adjacent interproximal bone height and soft tissue level because of our inability to coronally advance the tissues in these sites. In the next guideline, the authors state that in maxillary class 3 and multiple class 2 furcation involvement in the same tooth, non-surgical instrumentation, open flap debridement, tunneling, and root separation or root resection may be considered. Again, the choice of words by the authors is consistent with the grade assigned, an open recommendation, as it is supported by only six observational studies with low quality of evidence. Since we have already discussed our concerns for the other procedures, we will now focus on tunneling. Some factors of importance in the case selection for tunneling are patients with low caries risk, site factors such as morphology of the furcations, its divergence, length of root trunk, and coefficient of separation, the amount of residual bone support of remaining roots, and the amount of bone needed to be resected in relation to the adjacent interproximal bone height. Here, we aim to create a positive architecture and environment that facilitates self-performed oral hygiene followed by a strict maintenance program supplemented by the regular application of fluoride and chlorhexidine. This concludes our presentation, and on behalf of our team here in Hong Kong, I would like to express our gratitude to the EFP for organizing this platform and giving us the opportunity to get together and to learn from one another. We would also like to thank our professors and assistant professors who tirelessly work to make us better clinicians every day. Thank you again and a good day to all.